Okay, welcome to the Washington Institute. Uh, if you're in the East Coast, good afternoon. The West Coast, good morning. If you're in the Middle East, good evening. Um, we are convening here on Zoom to discuss what might be, I think, the deepest uh, internal crisis that Israel has faced since its birth 75 years ago. Uh, the turmoil um, as a result of the Israeli government's proposed judicial overhaul. It has sparked a massive amounts of protests over three months, week after week, day after day, strikes by Israeli Defense Force reservists, warnings of severe damage to the country's economy and its national security. After dismissal by the Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, provoked uh, of the Defense Minister by Prime Minister Netanyahu, sparked a, a major backlash. Uh, Netanyahu just announced uh, earlier this week for calling for a pause in all judicial changes uh, that were going to be enacted this week. And so we pulled back from the abyss, so to speak. There's going to be a month of uh, talks led by President uh, Isaac Bougie Herzog. It's a ceremonial position, but President Herzog is someone who is trying to avoid a wide chasm, and he's convened members of the coalition, the opposition, to discuss what can be done to avert um, the deep divisions in the country. So to discuss what is going to come up over the next week, we are really joined by um, you know two people that we at the Washington Institute rely on a lot for their sage advice and insight. Uh, one is Tamar Herman, no stranger to those of us who watch the Washington Institute event. She's a senior researcher, a senior research fellow at the Israel Democracy Institute, the academic director of the Viterbi Family Center for Public Opinion and Policy Research for nearly 30 years. She has helped produce landmark indices of Israeli public opinion, such as the Peace Index, the Israeli Democracy Index, and the Israeli Voice Index. So we're delighted that Tamar is joining us. We're also delighted that Zohar Palti, who's an international fellow of the Washington Institute, he previously served as head of the Policy and Political Military Bureau of the Israeli Defense Ministry for five-year period from 2017 to 2022. And he was the head of the Mossad's Intelligence Directorate. And I will be the third speaker, but it is... Uh, it is a great delight to share a platform with such distinguished people. And uh, there's a lot of interest in this issue, uh, as everyone knows. And I'm gonna turn it over to Tamar to start us off on the societal dimension of this crisis. What have we learned? Where does it go from here? What does it tell us about Israel? So Tamar, over to you. Are we here? I think it's... Muted or please. okay, you can yeah, now okay. Great, great. okay. Over to so you, Tamar. Hi, uh, I'm very glad to be with you because, uh, for the last uh, couple of weeks, I'm trying to explain to people from inside and from the outside what is happening in Israel, and to be quite frank with you. Sometimes I change my opinion about what's happening in Israel uh, by the day because things uh, move ahead so quickly here and, and uh, the perspectives that we get are actually changing uh, to uh, the extent that the definition of the situation is actually changing uh, with, the, with the events. Surely you all know that in 2020-21, uh, we experienced um, a combination of three crises at the same time. We had the medical crisis of the COVID-19. We had the um, uh, financial and the economic. Right. David, is there any problem? No, no, no. Keep going. Okay. Keep going. So we had the, uh, the medical crisis. We had the economic crisis. And we had... The political crisis, because since the end of 2019, we actually uh, uh, experienced a prolonged political crisis, which uh, 
by now ended up with uh, five election campaigns. Four of them uh, were not decisive enough in order to have a stable government for uh, a significant uh, period. We had the government for one year and then it collapsed. And now we have, and now we have uh, another uh, uh, government. This government should have been very stable because it's 64 uh, seats as opposed to, 50, uh, to 56 uh, seats. And one would have thought that, uh, okay, we can start healing uh, the wounds that uh, were inflicted on us during the last uh, uh, two and a half years and so. But it didn't happen. It didn't happen because uh, uh, quite uh, shortly after uh, the government was in place, they started a, a blitz of uh, judicial initiatives, and uh, some would call it an uh, over, or some would say reform. It depends where you stand politically, because everything in Israel, all uh, the vocabulary which one uses is based on their political uh, positioning. And uh, at the beginning, I think that the defeated political camp was, was in shock because uh, they didn't expect it coming so quickly. They didn't expect it to happen uh, so um, viciously, I may say. And uh, they saw it in a way um, beyond the, the very uh, items that were put on the table. They saw it as a means of totally crashing the opposition. In fact, the, the center left camp was defined uh, by its members, but also by the people of the other side and people from abroad as totally dead. Not only they felt that they were uh, dead at a specific moment, but if one looks at the demography, and I'll talk in a minute about the correlation between people's uh, political position and the social demographic positioning, uh, looking uh, to the future looked as if uh, there is no way of coming out of this very dismal political social situation. And then uh, quite quickly after this initiative by the government was put on the table, uh, it seemed that people started to feel a sense of uh, both um, urge and need to act uh, very, very quickly and massively. And also a sense of competence started to emerge in this uh, defeated uh, political camp. There was some hope that brought people together, people that sat isolated in their homes, uh, uh, crying over uh, the future of uh, the Israeli society and uh, the Israeli uh, political uh, uh, institutions started to uh, feel that they have to say something if, even if they will not be able to change thing, things uh, in, in a very significant way. And it started and it rolled on uh, a week by week, as you mentioned, at the beginning there were a few thousands uh, and then it turned into tens of thousands, and then even more than that. And um, it seemed that some people of, uh, I would say, magnificent managerial skills started to work on uh, the process uh, scene. They read everything about the 3.5% needed in order to change the, the political situation, the Harvard uh, 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 paper on, on, on this issue. They learned very quickly about the abilities of nonviolent protest uh, to um, gain momentum. Uh, they understood that they would need um, money, that they would need very good agenda, that they would need um, producers, like producers of festivals, in order to make people interested in what's going on and in order to project a sense of power. And indeed, this happened. 
in uh, less than two months, nowadays it's already uh, uh, three and, and, and even more uh, months, and uh, they managed to establish themselves as an extra parliamentary opposition, which proved to be more effective on all accounts compared to the parliamentary opposition. And indeed, the leaders of the parliamentary oppositions are hardly present in this anti-government uh, uh, campaign. There is something that should be explained here. The judicial uh, uh, plan that was put on the table is quite complicated. And it is even more complicated to explain to people why is it so dangerous? Because normally people are not interested in those issues. They can understand occupation and no occupation. But what exactly does it mean that the government will be more present in the commission for the nomination of the Supreme Court judges? People at the beginning said, okay, so what's the problem really? And it took the expertise of so many people in the academia, in think tanks, uh, uh, reporters, journalists, people from the outside, who all in a way joined forces regardless the, the disagreements between them on other issues. They managed to join forces in order to create an agenda that explained to the average Israeli uh, why is it dangerous. And in a way, I would say that this is the best civic studies lessons Israeli society has ever been given by expertise who normally do not bother to talk with the average people in the street. So from this perspective, people started to understand what's the balance of power between the, uh, uh, the various branches of, of, of uh, uh, the, the government, the judiciary and, and the Knesset. They started to understand how does the Supreme Court works uh, actually, and why does it matter who the judges are? They managed to understand uh, why is it uh, very dangerous that the government will be stronger than the other two branches, particularly as the Knesset is so uh, uh, weak uh, for many years now. So, uh, in a way, I think uh, uh, this is a very positive uh, development. On the other hand, I uh, uh, should also uh, mention that uh, what we, we've been seeing uh, in, in the last couple of months is uh, the very, very strong correlation between people's political views and their socioeconomic background. It is quite clear who the people on uh, uh, the anti-reform, uh, anti-overhaul, anti-government uh, camp are. They are more educated, they are uh, more well-off uh, 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 financially, they are uh, of the center, they are the urban people, they don't come from the periphery. Uh, many of them are high-tech uh, uh, people, who have uh, uh, connections uh, uh, outside of Israel, which they used in order to gain uh, some voice in, for example, in Washington, right? People uh, pulled some strings that the other side don't have. So the overlapping cleavages in Israeli society between level of religiosity, ethnic descent, uh, wealth, uh, place of, of residence, uh, uh, and so on and so forth, are now much more clear to people who in the past refused to think in these uh, terms. Actually, what we see is instead of cross-cutting uh, cleavages, which normally stand at the basis of stable democracies, now we see very, very clearly uh, the, the, the gaps between the, the various, as uh, in, the, in the past, uh, President Rivlin mentioned, the tribes in Israel. And it seems that the language that the two camps are talking uh, is very, very different. One camp is talking the, the democratic language. The other side is talking about the Jewish language. 
So this hyphenated definition of Israel as both Jewish and democratic is being put under a very, very large question mark as of today. More and more people do not believe anymore that it's possible to combine the two because these are not only abstract notions, these also have sociological uh, implications and political implications. And uh, this is why uh, I find the effort to uh, have some kind of a dialogue as a very critical at the moment. Uh, I'm, I would say that many people are not optimistic that anything good would come out of it, particularly as in his last speech, actually President Herzog associated himself with one uh, uh, of these two camps more than the other. So he's not being perceived as, uh, I would say, as an impartial arbitrator. But I hope that during the, the talks, things uh, will be uh, more, more balanced and maybe they should uh, uh, really use the, the um, services of facilitators, uh, actually professional facilitators. It's not enough to have the politicians or, or people who come from the civil service and, and, and what have you. So people do not believe that something uh, very significant is going uh, to come out, but still we have a month here. A month is enough both in order to come down a bit and we have Passover and then we have Memorial, the Holocaust Memorial Day and the Day of Independence. However, and, and also the protesters need some time out because people are exhausted. Uh, however, this time out, if, if nothing comes out of it, they may come to the, the streets uh, with much more power uh, and much more, uh, I would say, uh, sophisticated means of dealing with the situation. And also we see some demonstrations started to be initiated by the right side for, for a couple of weeks now. I'm telling people that if we have a protest movement, we will see uh, uh, in the short or in the longer term, a counter movement. Sometimes the government serves as a counter movement, but what we see here is the grassroots anti-protest movement taking momentum and parts of it are very uh, violent. And we certainly hope that we will not see a clash between uh, these two extra parliamentary movements. But uh, prophecy is not my expertise, so I can't really guarantee that this will not come true. And it would be very horrible if this would happen. Sure. All right. Thank you, Tamar, very much and uh, for providing this perspective. Now we go over to you, Zohar. And someone who's been in the defense establishment for so long, and the defense establishment has been so prominent in these protests, the, the, the dismissal of Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, the fact that Gallant felt he need to come forward, believing that there had been a lot of damage done from within. Uh, you, you come from that world. You could shed some light on that. You could shed some light. Also, what we're hearing is Mr. ben Gvir trying to start his own militia, is that part of the deal with Netanyahu? It's hard to imagine that, uh, you know, for a democratic country. But uh, Zohar, we want to hear your perspective um, as well. So thank you very much for joining us uh, here this afternoon in Washington. First of all, thank you so much, David. And uh, it's always uh, great to speak with all the Washington Institute, uh, Elo, Tratiz, whoever is watching us right now. And thank you for that. Um, I know that a lot of you are really into it and care about what's happening right now in Israel. And many of you are worried. We also worried. It's a rough time. In all my 40 years of service, challenges with bad guys, wars, Lebanon, West Bank, Iran, it seems to me that this is the most uh, difficult challenge that all of us are facing because it's internal. We never had the experience of splitting among ourselves in such a profound way. And there is not a winner and losers over here in this battle. 
we're all going to lose because it's the first time that we are not working as one entity, as one fist, we're divided completely. And all our enemy in the air see it. And thank God that also our friends see it. And no doubt that President Biden is one of the most best friends of the states of Israel. And he just noted it a couple of days ago. And he also couldn't stand my side. And he said whatever he said. But this is a situation. And it's so important that we'll talk about it. We'll speak about it. We'll be transparent about the situation that we have over here. And hopefully, I heard some optimistic in the, in the first uh, points that uh, Tamar just raised right now, and I wish that I uh, that she is right, but for the time being, uh, I don't see it. And I will tell you why. We used to grow up that there is no political dispute among the security services. We're all coming, we all jeopardize our life, we all contribute, we're going to the army, we're recruiting and things like that. This is the first let's say, event, or I don't know how to call it, that is already penetrated to the reserves. And what we see over here in Israel in the last two months, we, um, we are concerned. We are concerned because we see it in the Air Force, we see it in the Intel, and you know, the Israeli IDF is relying on the reserves. The reserves is part of the DNA of the Israeli um, defense forces and the fact that it's the first time that they drag us into this conflict this is a bad i used to serve so many governments in the last 40 years i serve right governments center governments left uh, not not necessarily there wasn't left government in israel in the last 40 years but let's say whoever came to the room as the prime minister you stand up you don't care about his political, whether he's left, Likud, Labour, uh, all the other parties that just raising now. He's the prime minister and you're serving under him. The fact that right now, there are some political elements over here that don't have the responsibility to look, not to touch the defense forces, not to touch the minister of defense, because this is something that unites us, that if something bad is happening, this is bad news to, the, to what's happening in Israel right now. And there is a great people over here right now in the streets that really cares about what will happen with the Supreme Court. That's the reason that we are out. Why we are out in the streets is because the Supreme Court, this is the defending shield of the security services. The Supreme Court, this is the guardian angel of the security services. We need them independence. We need them to preserve the DNA of Israel, to become democratic, to become uh, a country that freedom of speech is about everything, that we respect the others, that we accept the others, that there are minorities. There is part of Israel that is under military uh, occupation, that we have to take care about those minorities as well, whether we like it or whether not. We have a tremendous struggle with Gaza. And during conflict, we have to take care about them as well. And this is the Supreme Court in Israel. This is a very important layer in our DNA as democratic country, and we need to preserve it. And if somebody wants right now to change it, I'm not against to challenge everything, but you have to do it in a process, in a responsible process with a dialogue not to do something from today to tomorrow in two months. Change it, you don't do it in two months. What you do in two months is revolutions. And it's not a time for revolution right now in our security environment. For the question that David asked me regarding the Minister of Defense, we're kind of in a limbo. The states of Israel right now, we have a defense minister or we don't have a defense minister. We're a bit confused right now. We did, it's serious that this, a state like Israel will be without a definition who is the Minister of Defense right now. It's crazy in a way to act like that. And in a way, we need, because the situation around us right now is a bit shaky. In a minute, I will refer to what's happening with Iran, what's happening in Lebanon, and what's happening with the Palestinians. 
But no doubt that if you want to do something like that, first of all, you need a base that is unshakable. And this is the IDF and the security services. And if you are planting right now noises or whatever you called to our beautiful reserves that are doing such a great job in the last two months, this is something that makes us uh, to be worried. I spoke about the limbo and this is something that uh, I hope that the bad guys are not going to take advantage of it in the next few days. Two, two weeks ago, everybody was concerned about the Ramadan, whether the Ramadan, there will be a clash with the Palestinians, the West Bank. Right now, nobody is speaking about this issue. You think that something's fundamental changing the West Bank? No. It's the same Hamas, it's the same people that don't like the PA, it's the same people that want to, to appeal right now Abu Mazen, it's the same Hamas that from Gaza trying to challenge them, and it's the same Iranian that want to cause problem over here. Just in the last two weeks, we had two uh, severe attacks, one in uh, Greece against Israeli elements, that thank God uh, the Mossad uh, succeeded to help uh, Greece to foil it. There was a clash from Lebanon that a guy penetrate with a device, booby trap, uh, a lot of sea force to kill a lot of Israelis. The Iranians are doing a lot of stuff in order to advance in the nuclear program. And we need Israel to become strong and to deal with the real problem over here. And right now, this limbo and this chaotic situation that we have right now, and David just had uh, the privilege, or I don't know how to call it, to visit us like two weeks ago and to see what's, what the hell is going on right now in the streets of Tel Aviv. This is something that we never faced in the past. And we have to chat, we have to talk about it. We have to share it with you guys because you are part of us. Whatever is happening over here immediately reflect all the Jewish community around the world. You are not on the fence. You can't be on the fence. And we have the obligation to speak with you exactly how we speak with ourselves, that you will be part of us in this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sohar. Uh, sorry, David, I, I want to okay. refer to the National Guard that you asked me. I forgot yeah. to, to, to mention it. It's OK. The National Guard, this is something that we don't need. This is something dangerous that I don't know how, what will, what, from where they recruit it. People that we need to, to, that they will join to the IDF, we recruit them right now to the National Guard. And again, you want to do something like that? Okay, explain why, what's the need? How much time? What's the budget? From where the manpower will come? Many people of you are running businesses and things like that. This is a big thing. Just to sit in two minutes and to say, okay, we have Israel National Guard. We are not the United States of America with federal governments and things like that, but we need National Guard in order for crisis. If we have crisis in Israel, there is only one entity that know how to deal with this and with this big crisis. It's called the IDF. Now, if you split the Minister of Defense, like they've done, and we have two ministers in the Minister of Defense, and right now there is a National Guard, there is a police, and there is the IDF, how it will work. And you have to speak with people that will understand the logic why you need it. That's why we don't understand it. Right. All right. Thank you very much, Zohar, for your candor. And, and again, thank you, Tamar, for your sense of where things are playing out within Israeli society. I'm going to make some remarks. And then I urge you, if you want to uh, you have a question, just write in um, to our, you know, to our email policy forum at washingtoninstitute.org. So, uh, or you could uh, enter them in, into the Q&A function uh, as well below. So look, let me uh, try to pick up on what I'm hearing from my colleagues and how I see it. I wanna just talk a, a little bit about, use this pause, uh, whether it's a true pause or not a true pause, uh, because there'll be, or you know, people mobilizing and counter mobilizing, but I think it's important to take stock and look so at some of the salient points. And what does this mean also for, you know, is there a chance uh, for a deal? And what does it mean for the United States and and U.S. Israel relations? And uh, I know President Biden's remarks 
um, I think took his own staff off guard, according to my sources. Uh, what do I think that the president was trying to get across and what does it mean? So let's just say, and I, you know, I want to just say, uh, pick up something that Tamar said. I think we are witnessing the most powerful uh, protest movement in Israeli history, 75 years, um, as they're grappling with the biggest uh, domestic crisis. Uh, it is, um, we're hearing it's in 80 to 100 towns. I take Tamar's point socioeconomically. It, it probably skews a, a bit, but it's not just Tel Aviv. And we see a lot of kippot, uh, you know, head coverings of religious Jews in Jerusalem. This is not ultra-Orthodox. I don't want anyone to think, I think it's the majority of these people. They're not. But it is, and I went uh, on a, just to see it when I was there recently, also in Tel Aviv, you really see kind of a lot of segments of Israeli society. I was struck, I said to my wife after the first weekend, I said, there's 80,000 people that came out in the pouring rain. If 80,000 people come out in the pouring rain, to me, it suggests this movement has got legs. It's 220,000 uh, in the last weekend. Uh, and uh, it just keeps growing. Uh, often these protest movements peter out. This is, is going in the opposite way. Um, I think part of it is these people know what they're fighting for. They're fighting for the very character of the state as they see it. I'm sure if they're counter protests, they will say they're fighting for the character of the state. But these are not professional protesters. This has been incredibly well, as, as, as Tamar said, uh, well stage managed in terms of the organization of this, very careful for there not to be violence. These people, by waving the Israeli flag, they are trying to reclaim it uh, for very much for people in the Israeli center and center right, uh, as well as well as center left. And it has been like if someone would do a textbook, how would you do this? I think they will write about this uh, because the protest movement, in my view, is what brought the pause more than anything else. But they have to give an assist to one guy who they couldn't do it without him, and uh, Bibi Netanyahu. Uh, I think without Bibi's um, dismissal of the defense minister Gallant, you wouldn't have seen over 100, some people say 200,000 people come out close to midnight on a Sunday night. These were young people, many of them. I learned a new slogan in Hebrew, nafaltem al ador halonachon. You have fell on the, on the wrong generation, meaning... Don't underestimate us as young people. And this led to the Histadrut uh, closing down the country, essentially the main airport, Ben-Gurion Airport, for close to 24 hours until the prime minister said he was going to pause. So without the dismissal of Gallant, something that was incredible had, was just taken almost into the stratosphere. There was a backlash. People saying, hey, don't you want the defense minister to warn if there's a severe national security threat? Uh, and people don't understand, why haven't you convened the inner cabinet? Um, so I think there's there's uh, an assist there, uh, an unintended assist, I should say. Uh, and second is what what is, uh, and I think we hear this from Tamar and from Zohar, I think there's a profound societal crisis that cannot be ignored. Ironically, people like Ayatollah Khamenei and Hassan Nasrallah, uh, of course, they mean Israel harm. And so what I'm saying, it should be meant uh, tongue in cheek, but they deserve a Nobel Prize for always uniting Israel uh, in the face of terrorism, in the face of danger. Uh, there's nothing that unites Israel more than enemies and terrorists. And yet now it is the internal divisions that threaten Israel like never before. Um, as a colleague of mine just said, and he said, you know, look, there's, there's gradations here in this crisis. Yeah, maybe people will, will send their kid to the army at the age of 18, but it doesn't mean that kid is going to go into combat. It doesn't mean the kid is going to go to officer's course. It doesn't mean the kid is going to volunteer in the reserve duty. It doesn't mean the kid's going to go in the permanent army, uh, as many of the best and finest in Israel have done. Uh, so there, you need a sense of shared purpose. That has been the, the secret sauce of the state of Israel for 75 years the social cohesiveness, that has been its, its national resilience. And its enemies have assisted that by being so menacing. Uh, and now for that to come undone from within, 
is 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 very very ominous and i think people need to take this very seriously it has gone beyond the judicial question it's about what sort of country you want to live in and this is very big now i think a, a second conclusion interim assessment is is prime minister netanyahu his self images his self image was one of a grand strategist it's no secret that on his desk has been winston churchill Theodore Herzl, he saw these people as, as big thinkers. He wanted to be in that league. He aspired to that big league. But that means also to calculate correctly. And I think, you know, you could debate how much credit he gets for Israel as a startup nation, but he is the longest serving prime minister in Israel's history. And uh, look, Israel's GDP per capita has just, according to the World Bank, has just passed Germany, it has passed Japan, it has passed surpassed uh, England and France. And part of it is that high tech sector. It might only be 10% of the economy and 15% of the GDP, but they're 54% of exports. And that is something that he's been proud of a lot. The focus on infrastructure that has been so central. This has been what he would hope to be part of his legacy. The crowning hope he hoped would be uh, stopping the Iranian nuclear program or a breakthrough with Riyadh. As he said in his opening remarks from the first day he came into the Knesset, these are my priorities, uh, stopping the Iran nuclear, uh, a breakthrough with Riyadh and, and taming inflation. But nowhere did he say in those priorities, this judicial overhaul revolution, however you want to call it, this has been something where people have wondered, is this guy in charge of his own government? I have been a BB watcher for more decades than I, I probably want to admit, because uh, it's been a very long time. But the one thing you could always say about Netanyahu was he always wanted to be in charge of his government. And now we don't know. We don't know if one guy claims he has two hands on the steering wheel, but uh, a fellow named Rothman or a fellow named Justice Minister Levin has both feet on the accelerator. Um, we don't know where is Netanyahu. And people wonder, is that because he thinks they will give him a get out of jail free card and he needs them? He has no alternative to them. Uh, is it because he thinks the worse it is, the better it is? It's the only way to uh, kind of take the steering wheel back. It's hard to know. But what we do know is the polling data is something I've never seen. In a three month period, he's dropping six to seven seats out of 32. We've never seen that before. So I think he, you know, he he does these quick speeches, goes on prime time. The the night the prime time news Israel's at eight o'clock at about eight oh five. Sometimes he's running a few minutes late, but he'll do like five minutes, three minutes. But in my view, these are not helping him because he is not really responding to what people want to know. How, Mr. Prime Minister, is this going to guarantee a judici of an independent judiciary? Why haven't you convened the, the inner cabinet to discuss all these security threats that your national security people are discussing? Why do you speak of the Supreme Court like it's the 1990s and Aaron Barak is still uh, the chief justice when, when Ayala Chaket, a conservative woman who was the justice minister under the existing system, I think has succeeded in putting six of the 13 people on the court. Um, why don't you see the distinction between changing the rules of the game versus policy, which which uh, Zohar just mentioned? I mean, if you're going to, I love sports metaphors. If you're playing baseball, football, soccer, basketball, you have to agree what sport you're playing. How long, you know, if you're playing nine innings of baseball, uh, those things require consensus. And the same if it's a soccer game. I know baseball isn't popular there, but um but why can't you see that distinction between rules of the game and, and policy differences? And if you're not invited to Washington, why did you stop your defense minister, Gallant, from uh, coming to Washington to discuss the Iranian issue and other questions of national security? He hasn't answered any question. He doesn't do interviews with the Israeli press. He prefers to do kind of softer interviews, brief ones, with foreign media that don't ask the same penetrating questions that the Israeli media would do. And to me, that, that silence is thunderous. It's the loudest silence you can imagine. It suggests you don't have any answers. Because if you had answers, you would be getting it across. There's a phrase that Netanyahu likes to use, and it's been his motto for his whole life. It's called Hasbara, to explain. 
he's not explaining his point of view. And if he isn't, it suggests that he doesn't have one that he could defend to his public. I, I hate to say it that way, but uh, he is not answering the tough questions. Now the question is, will this compromise work? Can Herzog's effort work? Uh, and I think here, uh, we don't know. I think, frankly, what I've seen of Netanyahu when he's in a corner, the most important thing is get out of the corner. Uh, you know, you could always figure out what you're doing out of your out of the corner. He's got a month of a Passover recess, Israel Independence Day, uh, Memorial Day. I mean, he is a concerned that he's going to be booed at something that should be a crowning achievement, 75 years of Israel. Or now he's having uh, parents of uh, bereaved parents to asking him and his cabinet ministers, don't go to cemeteries. We've never seen this in 75 years of the state of Israel. Um, so his hope, I think, is to kind of uh, have a pause. I don't think he's going to buy these people off. I think these people, the demonstrators, think it's existential. I expect the counter demonstrators. I think this month might not be so quiet. Um, but it seems to me that um, you're not going to buy these people off. And his calculation is going to come down to one thing, it seems to me. What guarantees my political survival? That's what we've seen before. And I think if the polling data is as terrible for him as it is now, I wonder if it actually gives him political ammunition to go to these junior coalition partners like Smutrich and Ben Gvir and say, listen, the route we are on gone, we're, we are crashing into the ground. We need a course correction. We got to stop this. We need the public back on our side. Um, but if he feels it's not so bad, then the others will say, Mr. Prime Minister, it's not so bad. Go forward and, 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 uh, and, and stay with the hard right. So I think how this month turns out is based on that calculation. And that leads me to the final point, the Biden administration. Um, and like I said, I think it was what it used the sports metaphor. I think it was an audible at the line of scrimmage. Uh, his staff tells me he didn't, this was not planned. As a matter of fact, the Israeli, the American ambassador to Israel, Tom Knights, just went on television in Israel just a few hours earlier and said that there would be an invitation coming after Passover. Now, he didn't say which Passover, uh, and he didn't say immediately, um, you know, when that would, uh, would happen. Uh, but it, it was a shift. But I think this is Biden, the gut player, or the Israelis would say the Kishka. He, he spoke from the gut, from the heart, uh, believing that uh, he felt he had to do it. So why now? Why the day after Netanyahu actually paused, did the, pre the president come forward? Well, I think he was waiting for the Knesset vote. Israel was like kind of perched on the edge of the abyss, so to speak, on Wednesday. Uh, the heart of this uh, overhaul reform, however you want to call it, was supposed to pass Wednesday. Um, I do think he was a bit worried if he'd weigh in in a certain way, it would be used by the opponents to say he's weighing in on, on political, uh, you know, on, on, on the current issue of domestic politics. Uh, and he didn't want to be part of the parliamentary football game. But I do think that um, he's, I sense the tone is frustration. He made sure he said, I'm one of the great supporters, like other great supporters of Israel. He wanted to frame it in a certain way. He likes his framing is, if I have a problem with Israel, I solve it behind closed doors. And he started with this in January. It started also with Jake Sullivan coming to Israel quietly. You had Tony Blinken, the, uh, the, uh, the Secretary of State, and you had phone calls. I don't think all the phone calls have been publicized. And I think he's been frustrated that he thought like to tell Bibi, hey, Bibi, I know what your priorities are. Your priorities are Iran. That's what you really care about. And they're about Saudi Arabia. What are you doing? Uh, the line of nides that, that he made public. I, you can't have these regional changes when your backyard is on fire. So I think he was hoping that he could talk him out of it privately. And so I think there was a sense of real um, frustration here. Um, and I think that on a personal level, he's... Um, I think he's a bit irked because his son has put out things as if the CIA is funding these demonstrations. It's an insult to the intelligence of the Israeli people who are coming out by the hundreds of thousands. And it's an, it's an insult to Biden uh, because not just his son is tweeting this, but he's backgrounding uh, journalists on their travel. 
kind of trying to give this a, a bit of credence, maybe not the CIA and not public funded, but he is feeding that narrative. And that I think to the president is, is very hurtful uh, given their relationship of 40 years. And I think the final point is Biden is a true believer in the US-Israel, what I call the twin pillars, shared interests, shared values. And having a sense of, of, a, of a Western democracy, that's at the core of these shared values, of, of the rule of law, of an independent judiciary. This is all what makes the US-Israel relationship tick. I sometimes like to say shared interest binds governments, but shared values bind societies, and they give the shared interest deeper roots, like a tree uh, with deep roots. So you need both. The genius of the, of the Israel the Israelis in the U.S.-Israel relationship was they understood you need both for 75 years. And now the press, president is questioning it. So on the immediate political dimension, with this I conclude, I think he's trying to create a, a, a counterforce argument. It's not just about Ben Gvir and, and Smotrich, and they're holding the balance of power. And yes, I know you'd like to get Benny Gantz to the government, but Benny Gantz, who is soared because he is seen as the embodiment of unity, uh, it just went on television saying he's not joining your government. He was burned because you pour, pulled the rug out of him on the rotation, meaning there was a rotation of government. Benny Gantz joined after COVID, and and then the prime minister changed his mind. So, uh, but you know, could could Gantz do a you know a security blanket, a security net like Rabin had in the in the ninety three ninety five, where you don't join the government, but you're not relying on Smotrich and Ben Gvir by staying in the opposition of no. No confidence. I'm sure Biden knows a lot of this, but I think he's trying to say it's not just about the math of this coalition. Do you need Ben Gvir and Smotrich or you do not need them? you got to know that there's something on the line here in terms of the U.S.-Israel relationship and your relationship with me. So I don't see Biden backing off. Um, but I think what he's also trying to signal beyond the personal relationship, his love of Israel is strong. And um, that it's the shared values piece that for him goes beyond this crisis. And it, you play with the shared values at your peril. A lot of times Israelis think everything is interest. They have a phrase in Hebrew, hakol interesting, everything is interest. That's not the way Americans see it. Americans see it, it's, it's values. It starts with shared values. I don't mean to suggest all Israelis think of it, it's all interest. I think many Israelis think it's shared values too. But for this president, who has been an ardent supporter of Israel for his entire life, um, I think it begins with the shared values, and he doesn't want to see that come into peril, into it come into the mix. He wants to protect that. So we'll see how this month plays out. And I want to thank all my fellow panelists, uh, and I would like to open it up for any questions that we may have uh, from the audience. And um, I'm going to look at those questions right now. Um, but may, you know, and maybe I will start, uh, with Tamar and ask Tamar, how do you see president Herzog in all this? He seemed like the right person, the right place at the right time. Someone who's an, who's a lawyer, who's centrist, who is someone who is, um, you know, he was worried that the country's unity is being ripped apart. He's come up with parameters. And, um, you know, he, uh, you know, it's true, the coalition, though, hasn't endorsed it. Um, and they rejected it right away, it should be said. But I'm, I'm wondering if you feel that he's got a, a role to play. How big is his role in this month? How can he help shape the compromisers? This thing just so big that he's, you know, that we shouldn't have a lot of expectations from the president of Israel. Tamar? To start with the here. president of Israel uh, has ceremonial uh, uh, role, uh, basically. He is not supposed to intervene. Uh, and I'll remind you that when uh, President Rivlin uh, tried to intervene in, in politics, when we couldn't get to, to a stable government, he actually lost credit uh, um, on, on, on the public level. This time, I suppose it's a bit different because uh, people from both sides are, are very worried about what's going to, to happen. And I think that he's giving them space. 
how active he can be in bringing these two sides together, I really don't know, because in his second uh, speech to the nation, he took side, as I already mentioned it. Uh, so he is not uh, being perceived as, as totally impartial in that. And uh, therefore, I uh, um, really hope that besides giving them the space and his blessing and his presence, he'll also use uh, the services of people who know how to bring people together, not on, 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 on the society level, but on the political level. We know that there are experts uh, of, of bringing two political entities together. They have them in Harvard, they have them everywhere. So I do think that he can be the host. I'm not sure that he can be uh, a, a real player because the two sides actually are not, uh, he doesn't have uh, uh, an epistemic authority here to, to really push them into a place where they will give up on things that are very important to them. And, and one should also keep in mind that thus far, uh, uh, the anti-government uh, side is not talking about any compromise. What they're saying, we are not going to compromise. And, and, and the question is, will, they, will the, they be, I would say, flexible on issues that are not of top priority in order to have some quid pro quo when they demand to, to have far-reaching uh, uh, really compromise on, on, on the other side. So uh, I don't really know whether he is a, a strong person enough really to make them sit there until, you know, white smoke is going up the chimney. Okay, thank you for that. I. Zohar, over to you. Uh, and we have a question from Daniel Estrin from NPR, National Public Radio, an international correspondent. I think he's watching this from the Middle East. And he asked about the implications of this for the U.S.-Israel security relationship. Um, how do you see that? Uh, you know, you were in the defense ministry. You were in charge of policy at the defense ministry from 2017 to 2022. Do you think, are you concerned, uh, if, if you were in the job now, would you think, hey, I, I can't take certain things for granted in the relationship that I used to? Uh, he even asked about the conditioning of a, a military aid to Israel, which is something that no president uh, has been willing to do. Um, you know, it has not been an issue since the, you know, the 1973 war, really. Uh, I mean, you had a, a, a month uh, delay after the Osirak reactor uh, in 19, you know, in 1981. Um, but um, but uh, I'm just wondering, or, or, do you think that there's going to be a certain reassessment in the Israeli Ministry of Defense about what is on and what is off the table? Not yet. I think that the bond between us and the Pentagon and us and the American people and us and the White House, whoever is sitting over there, is profound. It's deep. They know us. No doubt that they're concerned and worry right now. We saw the president that he shared his concern with us publicly. But they know that... Um, there is a serious people over here in Israel that will do almost everything to keep Israel democratic and open and with the same values and virtues that the Americans have. And for the time being, it seems to me that we are there. We have our issues internally right now. We have to sort it out among ourselves. It's true that the Americans are part of us because all our national strategy, defense strategy is relying on the Americans. 100%. We don't have other allies beside Americans. We are not playing games with other countries like the other countries in the region. We have only one friend, true friend. It's the United States of America. And it's driving me crazy when I hear some members of the Knesset, of the parliament, that have no ideas about the deep 
and the profound relationship that we have with the United States that never had any responsibility on the shoulders before the lashing in the media against the Americans, against the president, against whatever. When I mean, it's not serious. Who the hell are you that you are right now coming and giving remarks and grades to the Americans if they have? The Americans are with us in any problems that we used to have in the last decades, in the good times. It's like a mishpucha in a way. When there is ceremonies, we're celebrating together. When there are difficulties, we are crying together or we are fighting together or we're doing things together. The fact that they have the ability to go and to do whatever they want right now regarding the Americans, it's drive the security services crazy. Because to build relationships, it's decades. To ruin relationship, it's minutes. And I don't think that right now the situation with Americans, it's in a, in a situation that it's so bad that you have to ask questions regarding the, the support and things like that. But no doubt that if Israel, at the end of the day, will change the DNA and will diverse itself from completely open country, relying on all the principles that the Americans share and we are sharing till today, no doubt that it might be one day that American will reassess. I saw the last polls that used to be in the Democratic Party. It's devastating. We have to figure out how we came to the point that this is the, 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 the way of thinking of a lot of Democrats regarding the states of Israel. We need to work on it. It seems to me that we lost a lot of engagement with the Jewish communities, mainly in the East Coast. We have a lot of work in order to maintain and to keep this relationship. But whether right now we are there or we're in a crisis or something like that, I don't think so. And I and I believe that um, uh, um, the people that are running right now, the Minister of Defense and the IDF and the Mossad and the other security services know how to speak in closed rooms with their, their fellows and to reflect very similar to what I'm doing right now. No doubt, when there is a, when there is an experienced guy that is leading the Ministry of Defense, that know the Americans, take for example the last Minister of Defense, Guns, that he used to visit in the Pentagon, if I remember correctly, five times in two years or six times, un, unheard of, meaning the close relationship. After uh, Guardian of the Walls, we came to the Pentagon and we got $1 billion extra from the Americans, from this president and from the Secretary of Defense in order to replenish the Iron Dome uh, ammunition. This is something that exactly why we need Americans over here, because only America can be uh, over here. The Americans are the one that holding the Middle East for, in Iraq in the last 20 years, in Syria. They are doing most of the job in the Middle East. We are doing a lot of parts because we're independent, because the Americans are so generous to share with us all the goodies. But our boys and our girls are in the cockpit. Those are the guys that's right now in the streets of Tel Aviv that they call them anarchists. They know how to fly the JSF. So before we are pouring criticism and things like that about our fellow Americans, a bit modesty from the people that are doing it. So, Zohar, let me just follow up on that. I mean, everything you said about uh, JSF, by the way, means uh, a, a, right joint strike fighter, and uh, the F-35. Uh, um, everything you just said, the prime minister knows. Why is he not able uh, to deal with this? Uh, I mean, I'm not a psychologist. I don't really care about his, his relationship with his son, but his own cabinet ministers you know, he he will report what I, what I call the boilerplate. Our relationships are unshakable, but it's not enough to say the boilerplate. The relationship is unshakable. He has to, I think, be seen as, as going after some of these ministers who, who have made the kind of irresponsible statements that you have made. And by the way, I'm not trying to defend everything the United States does at all. I, I felt when they called in the Israeli ambassador, Mike Herzog, on the repeal of the disengagement law, uh, which was was shocking about in, repealing it in terms of those four settlements in the north. Those that was the 2005 event, which the U.S. is very much a part of. 
you know, uh, and the U.S. was right to call Israel on it, but also maybe to reaffirm what President Bush said, which is if you reaffirm your part, we'll reaffirm our part, uh, which was the letter uh, of Bush to Sharon. But I guess my question is, why doesn't the prime minister discipline his ministers in the Likud? Even if you say Smotrich and Ben Gvir is another party, but his own ministers and his own parliamentarians who are making some of these comments, because the prime minister knows everything you know. How do you explain it, Zohar? Frankly, I don't know how to explain it because I know him. I used to serve under him many, many years. He nominated me to be the director of intelligence of the Mossad, and I knew a different baby. I don't know how to explain it. I'm telling you frankly. And uh, Tamar have more, much more expertise regarding socialism and uh, how people behave than me. And, but, but really, frankly, from professional point of view, security ones, he knows everything regarding this issue. He is and the I ask you, then I'm going to ask Tamar too. But but it's like the national parlor game, and it's also a question here that um, it's a national parlor game in our country, and, and of, of course in the, in Israel. Uh, you know, people say, did he shift because of his trial? What what led him to shift? I mean, the old Netanyahu defended the Supreme Court. You know, he was like Begin, and uh, we had video clips of him always saying, I will always defend the, the judiciary, the independence of the judiciary. That's the difference between a true democracy and a democracy on paper, I think he said. Um, when, do you, when did you see that shift, if you could say? Maybe it all didn't happen at once, I guess. but Because you were in the meetings with him for, 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 for many years. David, I'm telling you, I don't know to give you an answer. I don't know what change over here. I'm not sure that uh, I know how to explain uh, some issues that he have with the government, with himself, with the, all the prosecutions and things like that. I don't know. Yeah. But I know yeah, something yeah. like that. I, 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 I don't, you know, you're not used to that the Israelis say we don't know something. Yeah. Usually we know Speechless. everything. Speechless. I got it. All right. So let me uh, just go back to you, Tamar, because you you mentioned um, something relating to, um, you know, the, the counter marches that you expect to come uh, right now. I think so far the ultra orthodox are saying they're not going to march. It's you know, they're getting ready for Pesach, or you know, for the Passover season. Uh, and uh, they have often tried to uh, to, you know, not come out on issues that they are, do not see as, as a religious questions per se. But do you, is there something that in these counter marches that you think we should be looking for that uh, about this? Obviously, people look at the size and say, well, the people in Tel Aviv are 220,000 people. You know, how how is the right going to galvanize? It's interesting that the prime minister is, I think, retweeting those who are calling for demonstrations on the right and i'm just wondering kind of how do you how do you see uh the right uh how do they how do they mobilize during this pause okay right now while we are talking thirty thousand people of the right are marching in the streets of tel aviv they are now blocking the ayalon road which uh was the strategy used by uh, uh, the anti-government protest. It, it's symbolic, of course. They could have marched elsewhere and they could have uh, blocked another road, but it was uh, like a statement. What you can do, uh, what you can do, we can do better. They couldn't do better thus far, but we really don't know what will happen in the future. Certainly the number of those defining themselves as being on the right now is much, much higher than the number of those who define themselves as being on the center and left. It's like 64% compared to 25 at the center and 11, 12 on the left. So even if you combine the left and the center together, they are less than, than the right. However, in our polls, what we see is that quite a significant number of those defining themselves as uh, right-wingers, they do not support 
every item on the overall uh, uh, program of the government. I mean, the right is indeed bigger, but it is not as united as it used to be because we tended in the past to say, well, look at the right, they are so united around the leader and they uh, get over these agreements between themselves and so on, whereas the left was fighting over every, you know, uh, 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 nuance in, in, in the agenda put on the table for them. But now we start to see some cracks on, on, on the right as well. Um, now, the question is, uh, uh, are they going to use the same means? It is not uh, quite obvious that they will uh, do the same acts like, like the other government protest uh, is, is taking. So uh, now we, we do see them marching, but they can do other things. They, they can really use and they are more open to the usage of violence. Uh, uh, then, uh, and, and, and to use, uh, I would say, illegal and sometimes even non-legitimate means in order to uh, have some impact on what's going on. It is not a copycat things necessarily. So uh, uh, right now they, they try to show that they can do the same things, but I'm very afraid that they may use other means with the blessing of uh, Ben Gvir and uh, his people, not necessarily Netanyahu, but even he might, uh, in order to get some evidence that the people are behind him, he already did encourage them to go uh, uh, in the streets and he might do it uh, in, in, in the future. So uh, the question is, will they be organized by not necessarily people uh, who are just citizens, but maybe by professionals that we've, will be sent there in order to organize larger rallies, uh, uh, more, uh, uh, I would say, uh, dangerous means in order to, to prevent future uh, demonstrations by, by the center left. Thus far, the participants of the center left uh, were not really afraid that something very bad is going to happen to them. But if uh, they, it will become more risky, we may see a decline in the numbers of those willing to go in the streets against the government. So it's, it's a very delicate game here of uh, uh, what can be done in order to stop uh, the um, the extension of uh, uh, the anti-government uh, uh, movement. I mean, you mentioned violence. I mean, we're hearing terms that we've never heard. I mean, you know, God forbid, a civil war and things like this. I have to believe, I mean, you're doing the polling. I, I've seen numbers saying is a civil war unthinkable, but it's not the same to say, do you think it's is really going to be one right now? Uh, and, you, you know, you're the national, one of the leading national pollsters. Um, I mean, and I, I mean, I look at Benny Gantz's popularity that his numbers have almost doubled, uh, since the, uh, the election of November, it's only a few months. It seems to me the country wants compromise. They want to come together. Uh, you know, it, everywhere I went in Israel on, on this recent visit, you know, they, people would say, Chayavim Pshara, there has to be a compromise. How, how do you see the Will the threat of violence bring Israelis together? Like we have to pull back from the brink, they might say, or does the violence tear the country into deeper division? Um, I mean, it's hard to, 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 and we hope that we never have to even think about these questions. If, 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 if the threat of violence will, will unite the people to pull back or it will make people more and more angrier uh, I guess it's hard to speculate in the abstract about this, but it's things that I don't think we'd ever thought we'd have to think about. And I, as you as a pollster, I'm just wondering what it's like for you to have to deal with these questions of, of, of violence, civil war, things that, that were unthinkable until now. Okay, we found out uh, uh, over 70% of the entire uh, population are uh, wishing to see dialogue going on and some kind of a compromise. Seven, zero. To, seven, 
seven zero. In order to have seven zero, you need many people of the right to be there because of the proportions yeah. that I presented right. earlier on. So apparently the majority uh, on the right and of course on the center left are not looking for violent means in order to get to some uh, end of story scenario. Now the question, will they be able to control these uh, very small and radical groups uh, that we saw them in the past using violence mainly against Arabs, Israeli Arabs and uh, La Familia, the supporters of the Beta Yerushalayim uh, soccer group, they, they uh, uh, are most willing to, to use uh, uh, a violence. If they'll get some green light from uh, the top, uh, they might uh, do things that we never thought we will see in, in, in the streets of Israel. And then, of course, you will see some reactions from the center, la uh, right, center uh, uh, left uh, uh, movement, because also there, you have people who know how to use violence. They are not willing, they don't want to use violence, but once they uh, are attacked, if they have to, to uh, protect the supporters of their side, the, the protesters, they might also use some, some means that we have never thought about. Okay, And we also see that about half of the interviewees are afraid that we are going to see sooner or later, if this thing is not resolved, to see a civil war in Israel. So this fear may on the one hand, make people more open to the idea of compromise, but the question is who blinks first? And uh, after uh, the latest speech by Netanyahu, there was a sense that he blinked first. But then the day after uh, his speech, they put the the the, uh, the proposal of the of the law on the Knesset table, and then people said, "No, he didn't actually blink. He's trying to manipulate us." So it's much about, uh, I would say, trust of the other side. You can't get to a prom uh, to any compromise if you don't trust the other side. And now there is a total mistrust of of Netanyahu and his people on 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 the other side. So I'm. This is why I said professionals, 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 you know, that to, to work out some confidence uh, um, building measures. Uh, uh, now the question is, is he interested in that at all? And this is the question that you asked Zar uh, thus far. We don't see him really being interested in, in, in uh, uh, bringing people into believing that he is coming in good faith. So uh, we, we need the national psychologist here. <laughs> All right. So right, I'm going to ask the question, the last question you, uh, I not ask you as a national psychologist. I'm going to just ask you one question of a term we haven't even talked about that because it's not directly related to the crisis, but we cannot ignore the period we are in, which is the period of Ramadan. Uh, and it's going to converge with Passover uh, the last two years, I think, during the intermediate days, what's called Hebrew Chola Moed, uh, the intermediate days of Passover, when there is a whole group that ascends the Temple Mount, there's some reporting, I don't know if it's verified, that, that Itamar Ben Gvir is going to go up during that period. Uh, last time, he, all he took was a walk for 13 minutes, and um, it was a major international storm. Um I'm, you know, now it's it's Ramadan, but it is not converged. It's like I said, the three years in a row now, I believe, Ramadan, Passover, and Easter have converged. Next year, it does not. The, the, the security services in Israel and Jordan and Egypt have all been planning for this, and the Palestinian Authority have all been planning. They've had meetings in Aqaba and in Sharm el-Sheikh. Um, how worried are you about violence of uh not of the of the internecine variation between Israelis or, or but during Ramadan that that's really my final question I'll just say as an anecdote I was sitting and having a dinner with a friend when all of a sudden on the screen it said injuries in Tel Aviv and uh people didn't know was this a violence among Israelis or was this violence of Israelis and Palestinians and they go, oh, don't worry, it's just another terror attack. I mean, it's just Absolutely. so crazy how, how things. Crazy. 
What did you say, Tamar? It was crazy because it was on Dizengoff Street. Dizengoff and, and Street. In fact, we prayed that it would be a, a regular terrorist act. And I mean, and that shows you. I'm just trying to show how absurd things are. And this, my final question is, is you know, all these preparations, uh, Zohar, and but the country's focus is elsewhere right now. The security people are very focused on this, but the country has got other things. How worried are you about uh, this Ramadan? First of all, that's uh, this is the job of the security services, that everybody will do whatever they want to do, and they will take care about the security. This is how the bond between the security establishment and the, the citizens is working in Israel. In regular days, most of the Israeli in Passover are going to vacations abroad or to with the family to travel all over the country or something like that. It seems to me that this Ramadan and this Passover and let's say wait and see Independence Day, a lot of people will be in the streets in demonstrations. So if you ask me what's the first priority right now, it's not Iran, it's not Hezbollah, and it's not the Palestinians with all the respect to all of them together. It's the internal issue at home. And this is what is really, really concerning us, that instead of that the priority will be our challenges from the outside, right now we are dealing with the challenges that we have from the inside that's splitting us. After saying that, it's true that one week, let's first of all see next, uh, to, tomorrow it's Friday. Let's see how the prayers in the Temple Mount will pass tomorrow morning. Secondly, we have another three weeks. Three weeks, you know, it's eternity in the Middle East, in our neighborhood. Uh, I'm sure that the Center of Command and, uh, and the Shabak will do uh, almost in order to uh, keep the quiet. Uh, we gave a lot of uh, recession, we gave a lot of things to the Palestinians in order to overcome this, uh, this period. I'm sure that Kogat have also a package in his pocket in order to give some more reliefs to the Palestinians that everything will try to come uh, to pass uh, calmly. But then again, nobody knows how to anticipate another terrorist attack can flame Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, God forbid, like uh, that. And if Hamas will uh, choose to challenge us like he've done like two years ago uh, by launching uh, missiles or something like that, again, it seems to me for a scenario like that, just to try to be a bit, you know, uh, responsible and optimistic over here, the system, the Israeli system know how to deal with it. If somebody will try to challenge us right now, we know how to do it. We know how to put all the argument aside and to give uh, an answer to anyone that will try to attack us. The main problem is that there is a lot of mistrust right now and there is not a bond right now. And this is something that we have to work on it and maybe uh, what Tamara said, that we have to go to a national uh, therapy, uh, but uh, we have to find the, the right shrink in order to deal with uh, almost 10 million people over here at the simultaneously. And uh, a lot of them are Jews and, you know, Jewish together, it's a, it's a problematic. But anyway, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Well, I want to thank here. you both wish, for, for being with us. I want to thank uh, both of you, both, both Tamar Herman and Zora Palti for joining me today. I want to hope for this religious season passing peacefully uh, to our Muslim listeners, uh, Ramadan Karim, to our Jewish listeners, uh, Chag Sameach as Passover approaches, also Easter is approaching. So it's a religious season for everybody, and we hope that that be a message of both peace and freedom. Uh, at this key time. So thank you all very much for joining the Washington Institute today. Thank you. Yes.